All right, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jay, host of the Technical File Podcast and host of the SJP Files, brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and any other podcast you listen to. You can make money from your podcast, no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Once again, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's time! Round now, say the same thing. They chase the fame. They got what the name. All right, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today is another episode of the Technical File Podcast. I am your host, Jay, and today we got a host of topics going through. Uh, the NBA Finals Game 3 happened last night. We have a proposed trade on Twitter that I want to look into from the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Detroit Pistons. We also have a, bleacher, a couple Bleacher Report topics that I want to hit today. The NBA free agents who can put a top contender over the top. Um, You know... Chris Middleton and, well, Giannis Antetokounmpo, especially today. Um, And UFC 264, man. Uh, Watch the card. I watched the main card. Like I said before, if 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 you're new to the show, I do not watch the whole card. It's like six hours. You got the the early prelims on ESPN, and then you got the prelims on ESPN Plus, and then you have the main card for pay on ESPN Plus. I have no interest whatsoever in, I like mixed martial arts, but I cannot watch seven, like six, seven hours of mixed martial arts. I just can't do it. I don't have the time. I don't have the patience. I love mixed martial arts. If this was like seven, eight years ago, maybe when I was still really, really heavy into it, I would have done it. But right now I'm just not that heavy into it anymore. And I took a long break off. I'm getting back into it now. But uh, we had a really good card, a couple really good fights. Uh, The main event was kind of disappointing because of how it ended, but we'll get to that later. Right now, the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks, game three, Milwaukee wins 120 to 100. They just, they dominated, really. Between the second and the third quarter is when this game really ended. I mean, they were up by, what was it, like 15 at halftime? I want to say, yeah, it was 60 to 75. They're up by 15 on by halftime. And then they extended that to, I want to say, what was it like 21? Something like that. It was in the 20s by the time you hit the third quarter. And by that time, the game was over. In the third quarter, I ain't going to lie. They did push it a little bit. Got it down into single digits. Uh, I believe in the somewhere in the third quarter, like in the middle of the third quarter, they got it down to, I want to say, about five points. And then the Bucks just put it on him. And Giannis Antetokounmpo had a phenomenal game, as per usual, 41 points, 13 rebounds, 6 assists. He was 14 for 23 from the field, 13 for 17 from the free throw line, 76% from the free throw line. Chris Middleton didn't have a phenomenal shooting night, but he had a good shooting night. He was not, well, I wouldn't say good, but eh, he had an okay shooting night. 42% from the field, 42% from three, 18 points, seven rebounds, six assists. He had 15 points in the first half, which is more than he had all last game. He slowed down in the second half, but in the first half, like I said, he had 15 points. He had 11 points in game two. And as much, I know people are like, because people are essentially... I've been listening to talk radio essentially all morning. Not really all morning, but I have been in and out of talk on the stuff on television all morning. 
And I know there are a lot of couple guys like Nick Wright and like Brandon Marshall and all those guys on like First Take and ESPN Plus and uh, First, yeah, First Take and Undisputed and uh, First Things First talking about, man, the Bucks have control of this series now. I don't see it that way. I do not see it that way. I saw Giannis have another fantastic game. And then I saw Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton show up and the Bucks won by 20. And Devin Booker had a really poor shooting night tonight. I do not expect that to happen. That's not something you're going to expect to happen multiple times in a series. I know he sat the whole fourth quarter. But Chris Paul played well, 19 points, nine assists. That's what you're kind of expecting from Paul. DeAndre Ayton, another fantastic game, 18 points, nine rebounds. I wish the, the rebounds were a little more, but he was good throughout this game. Cam Cameron Johnson tried to end P.J. Tucker's career with, man, he dunked on him hard. Awesome. It was it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Cheers for Cameron Johnson. Uh, Jay Crowder shooting the lights out. He had 18 points off on the three-point line, six for eight, six for seven from three, 85% from the three-point line. If Devin Booker had been a – if this had been a normal Devin Booker game, this would have been a nail-biter, close game, you know, in the – yeah, because Devin Booker, yeah, if this, had, like, if this had been a normal Devin Booker game, this is a nail biter at the end of the game instead of Devin Booker just not playing the fourth quarter. So I do not see this as a, I still have Phoenix winning. I still have Phoenix winning in six. I, I was adamant. I believed Milwaukee was going to win tonight because I believe Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday were going to show up tonight. One or both of them were going to show up tonight. Drew Holiday showed up. 8 for 14 from the field, 5 for 10 from 3, 21 points, 9 rebounds, 5 assists. He played very good. He played great defense on uh, Devin Booker. Not Yeah, he played very well, good defense on Devin Booker and Chris Paul. Chris Paul was just, you know, doing Chris Paul things tonight. Uh, there was a big free throw disparity in this game. Well, not – I wouldn't say it was a huge free throw disparity because the free throw disparity was by 10, but Giannis was the guy who shot – pretty much all the free throws for the Bucks. Not even pretty much. Uh, he shot 17 of their 26. That's nine. He There were nine free throws taken by this team that he didn't take. And as for the Phoenix Suns, their free throw disparity was fairly similar. And the rebounding thing doesn't worry me too much. Total rebound, 36 to, was it 47? Out rebounded by nine in this game. No, eleven. Sorry, out rebounded by eleven. Doesn't bother me that much because of the injuries to um, not or something to the injury to Dario Sarge, which had Frank Kaminsky playing thirteen minutes. That would have been Dario Sarge's time, and I think you could have definitely used that tonight. But I'm not incredibly worried. Like I said. This series is going to come down not to how great Giannis is, but to how consistent Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday are. Because if you can get two, if you can get three more games like this, you're going to win this series. The question is, can you get those three games in a row? Because if you can get those three games in a row or three of the next four, you will win this series. The problem is, I don't trust either one of these guys. Nothing in this playoff series, nothing in this whole playoff run has led me to believe that Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton are going to show up every game. Nothing has shown me to prove, nothing has proven that to me. And Devin Booker, I know essentially what I'm going to get from him. I know I'm going to get somewhere between 25 and 30 points pretty much every game. No, he's, he had, he's been on and off since his since that broken nose in what was it game two of the western conference finals he's been kind of hit and miss he's been a little off but he's still hooping he's still hooping and last game was no different last game what booker had 31 points last game he had 31 last game he had 31 in game one, and I'm trying to remember what he had in. Yeah, he had 31 in game one and 
27 in game 31 in game two, 27 in game one. I'm not, like I said, I'm not worried. I still have the Phoenix Suns winning this series. And Giannis is putting some crazy numbers together. And because he's putting up 40 point games in the NBA finals, and because LeBron's done it so often, people are kind of, well, he's just putting up 40. You take LeBron out, I mean, I think MJ's got six, and I think Shaq has five. Pretty much everyone else you can possibly think of who has scored 40 in the NBA Finals has one. Has one, maybe two. I think Kobe's got one. I know Durant has one. Uh, I don't think Curry has any. Uh, Dame's never played in the NBA Finals. I don't think Barkley has any either. I think Bird has one. Kareem. I know for sure has one. I can't remember what game it is, but I watch. But I watch. I found that game uh, somewhere online. But yeah, I watched that game. It was, and off the top, off the top of my head, I can't really think of anybody else who's got fifty point games like that. You just can't do it. And <clears throat> and through the first three quarters of last night's game. Giannis was only the fourth player in NBA history to have 30 points, 10 rebounds, and five assists through three quarters. Jordan did it in 97. LeBron did it in 2016. Durant did it in 2018. And Giannis did it last night. There's not much else to say. These are two of the best teams in the Western Conference. I mean, two of the best teams in the NBA. The Phoenix Suns prove their worth to get here. I still believe they're going to win this series because I trust Booker more than I trust Middleton or Holiday. I trust Booker to show up night in and night out. And as for Milwaukee, I have no idea what I'm going to get from these two. From night to night, I do not know what I'm going to get from them. Am I going to get game three or am I going to get game two? What am I, what am I going to get? Am I going to get, yeah, a game three or a game two? A game three where they both show up or a game two where one of them shows up? Or is it a game or is it, yeah, or is it a game, yeah, sorry, reverse that. Is it a game one where one of them shows up but the other one does it? Or is it a game two when neither of them show up? And they're both awful from the field. That's the real question. Am I going to get... Because tonight... Because when you step onto the court with the Milwaukee Bucks, you got three options. It's Giannis shows up and either Middleton or Holiday show up. It's Giannis show up and neither of them show up. Or it's Giannis show up and they both show up. That's the issue. That's what I believe. I I said this last episode. That's what's going to cost them a championship. That's what could possibly cost them a championship this year. The inconsistency of your number two and number three guy. I know. And now after game one and after games two and three, I know I'm going to get around 40 points from Giannis every single night in this series because there's nobody on Phoenix who can stop him. I thought DeAndre Ayton might be able to give him some trouble in the middle, you know, meet him at the rim a couple times. That's not happening. That's just not happening. And Jay Crowder, he had a few good defensive possessions on him last night, but he can't guard Giannis. Mikel Bridges can't do it either. Neither can Cameron Johnson or Tory Craig. Mikel Bridges didn't exactly have Mikel Bridges didn't have like the standout performance he had in game two. And with Booker not having a and with Booker having a very off shooting night, you got blown out by 20. You got blown out by 20. It's it's nothing like big. You know, Mikel Bridges has averaged about 11 points throughout this playoff run. And that's what I expect to see from him. I expect to see him give me 11 points. If he had given you his normal 11 points and Booker had given you his normal like 25. This is a really close game decided by one or two shots. So I'm not one of those guys who's like Milwaukee has full control of this series. Now they're still down a game. 
I don't know where that's coming from, that they have absolute full control of this series. It makes no sense to me. It makes absolutely no sense to me that anyone thinks they have full control of this game. It's wild. It just is. Why would they have full control? They have done nothing to prove they have full control of this series. Yeah, they've out out rebounded Phoenix in all three games, but they're still losing. They still lost two in they yeah, like they still lost two in Phoenix. Now this could be one of those series where it's all tied up going back to Phoenix. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I wouldn't be shocked if this is a, you know, tied two to two going back to Phoenix. But I still have Phoenix winning this series in six. And I have yet to see anything that changes my mind. Now, if I will change my mind about Milwaukee winning this series when Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday string together three consistent games. Because I have yet to see that all postseason. I have yet to see them, the two of them, together, string together a consistent, like, six-game, consistent three-game performance. It's two games and then a bad game, like a really bad game. Or it's one game or they trade off one guy's good one in game two, one guy's good in game three, the other guy's good in game four, and then it's back to the other guy in game five. I have yet to see them together string together three straight games of we the two best players, aside from Giannis, we're the two best players on the court type shit. Or we're the two best shot creators on the court type shit. I have yet to see that, and I'm not, and I'm not changing my opinion. I would if this if they tie it up and win game five, then I will say Milwaukee wins in six. Then I will say Milwaukee wins in six. If they're up three two, I'll say they'll win in six. But I'm gonna make my prediction right now. Because I believe when does the next game take place? I believe the next game takes place. I think it's two days. So I want to say Thursday. Let me look up NBA.com real quick, but I'm pretty sure it's Thursday. One second. What you know about rolling down in the deep? When your brain goes numb, you can call that mental freeze. When these people talk too much, put that shit in slow motion. Yeah, I feel like an astronaut in the ocean. Ay, what you know about rolling down in the deep? When your brain goes numb, you can call that mental freeze. When these people talk too much, put that shit in slow motion. Yeah, uh, game four is... No, it's Wednesday. So today, yeah, today's Monday. Uh, yeah, game two, is, game four, sorry, is Wednesday. If they win game four on Wednesday, if they win game four on Wednesday and game five on Saturday, I will say the Bucks are your new NBA championship champions on this podcast. But until that happens, no. Until that happens, no. If that happens, get out of here. Until that happens, get the hell out of here. No. You've been so inconsistent. Your two other stars have been so inconsistent that Giannis has been carrying these dudes. All playoff series. All this entire playoff run. Giannis has been carrying these motherfuckers. Damn near averaging 30 points in this playoff run. Averaging his averaging 37 minutes. He's fantastic, but I have no belief whatsoever that the Milwaukee Bucks are going to just steamroll the rest of the series. They hit their groove, and they're just going to dominate. They're just going to dominate the rest of this series, and that's it. Just going to crush Phoenix for the rest of this series. They, they have the formula. They have the formula. They have the power. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Phoenix, I'm going to make my pick. Phoenix is going to bounce back in game four in Boston. 
on Boston in Milwaukee. They're going to win game four. It's going to be a tight game. Booker's going to ba- bounce back. Mikel Bridges is going to hit some open shots. Jay Crowder is going to hit some open shots. He's not going to have 18, but he's going to hit some open shots. Chris Paul is going to keep doing Chris Paul things. DeAndre Ayton is going to have another really good DeAndre Ayton type game. Cameron Johnson and and actually, I don't know what I think Cameron Johnson will play pretty well. He played well. I think he'll be better shooting. I don't think he'll have 14 points, but I think campaign will do a little bit better. But I think they're going to bounce back in game four and they're going to Go back to Phoenix up 3-1. I still have Phoenix in six. That's more me kind of hedging my bets, essentially. But I still got Phoenix in like six. They could very well win in five. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened in five. But that's who I got. I got Phoenix. Game four on Wednesday. Bet. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. And then when we get back, we're going to hit on, let's see, uh, proposed trade on Twitter. Then we're going to hit on NBA free agents who could put contenders over the top. And after that, we'll see how much time we have left to hit on the UFC 264 Poirier versus McGregor 3 breakdown. And all right, all right, all right, we are back. Uh, let's see. Where were we? What was I going to talk about? It's been a minute. Oh, yes. The proposed trade option on uh, Twitter from uh, Theo Maldom. Uh, OKC trade. S- the This year's sixth and eighth. Next year's first that they got from the Nuggets. And the 2024 first that they got from the Thunder for the Detroit Pistons number one overall pick this year. If I'm the Oklahoma City Thunder, of course I do this trade. What? Why not? You got like you got like a thousand draft picks in like the next five years, like the next five, six, seven years. Why not? If you think Cade Cunningham is the dude some people think he is, then do it. If he's the dude some people legitimately think he is, then yes. You make this trade. On the other side, if you're Detroit, if you think he is the dude you think he is, then you don't make the trade. And honestly, I'm I'm trying to think. Because let me pull up a, let me pull up the NBA.com mock draft. Because you got the Pistons taking Cunningham, the Rockets, Evan Mobley, the Cavaliers, Jalen Green. The Raptors, Jalen Suggs, the Magic, Jonathan Kuminga, the Thunder, Scotty Barnes, Davion Mitchell goes to the Warriors, James Brooknight goes to the Magic, Keon Johnson, the Kings. Oh, we got ooh, the Pelicans and the Hornets. Got like like five players in their like in their like common thing. This is so stupid. Keon Johnson, yeah, France Wagner to the Pelicans, Josh Giddy to the Hornets, Moses Moody to the Spurs, Jalen Johnson to the Pacers, and I have no idea, international dude from Turkey to the Warriors. If you were the Pistons, because if you go down to six with the Thunder, six and 18, if you go down to six, you're in that, like, you're in the Scotty Barnes range. And Scotty plays a similar position to a uh, Jeremy Grant. So, hmm. if I'm Detroit, I don't think I would do it. I think Cade Cunningham is so far and away. Cade Cunningham is far and away the number one overall pick this year. Well, he is the number one overall pick. I wouldn't say far and away. It's Take that back. He's not far and away. He's not like flat out generational talent. Doesn't matter who's the number one pick. They're taking him. He's going to be the number one overall pick. But I don't know how many people see him as franchise changing guy. If he's a franchise king changing guy for Detroit, you don't make this trade. What? What are you high? 
if you're Detroit, you do not make this trade if you legitimately believe that Cade Cunningham is this dude. And I saw somebody in the comment section, what was it? Uh, Sportsaholic Podcast. Uh. Yeah, the, the, the Sportsaholic Podcast. Uh, no. You, I know he said Detroit can compete right with can compete their team complete their team right now with this one guy. They have what everyone covers a six five playmaking guard with three point range, a six seven two twenty three and D big wing high ceiling, six eight tough rebounding small ball five six eight two ten two way three level scorer big wing veteran stop gap and a six eight two twenty do it all wing. Okay, I might. Eh, I don't know about that. I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that. But if he, if you honestly believe Kate Huntingham is a franchise changing guy, you make this trade. You do not make this trade. If you, for Oklahoma City, if you believe he's the guy, you make this trade. If Detroit, you believe he's a guy, you do not make this trade. If you're not high on him, if you are not completely high on him, then no, you don't make this trade. What Detroit could do is take this from Oklahoma City and then maybe put together a package some around centering around these pick that might be able to get you to the number two overall pick with Evan Mobley from the uh from the Houston Rockets. But like I said, if you're Detroit, you don't do this trade. If you honestly believe Cade Cunningham is a franchise guy in Oklahoma City, you do whatever it takes to do this trade. If you believe Cade Cunningham is a franchise guy, you put him in the backcourt with uh, SGA. And that's a backcourt that could be dangerous for a long time. That's a backcourt that, man, that's a long, athletic, scoring, defensive backcourt that could give the Western Con that could be a problem in the Western Conference for like almost a decade to come. So, if I'm Oklahoma City, I do this. I pull the trigger on this trade in a heartbeat. If Detroit is stupid enough to do it, and if I'm Detroit, don't be stupid enough to do it. Do not give them a reason to clown you. Also, something else came up on my timeline from LeBron fact check. On Twitter, Larry Bird won won championships. He won three championships with three Hall of Famers on his team. Magic and Kareem won together with other Hall of Famers on their team. Jordan won with Pippen, Rodman, and other All-Stars. Kobe won with Shaq and Gasol, both Hall of Famers. But God forbid LeBron win with any good player. Yo. Just facts. Just straight facts. Can we go? Really? We treat LeBron different than we treat any other superstar in basketball history. We never even gave Jordan this level of shit. When we weren't talking about Jordan as the greatest player of all time until Jordan won his his first three rings. When LeBron won, when Jordan won his first three rings, that's when people started calling him the GOAT. But now we at the point where, really? And here's this, and, and, and here's this nonsense from, from one of these guys. It was it EUQ1. Bird, Magic, Jordan, and Kobe were not flip flops like LeBron. They had issues with the team, but worked through their differences and stuck with their team forming a dynasty unlike Flip Flop LeBron. What nonsense is this? You fucking idiot. First of all, Kobe was about to leave the Lakers in that run after Shaq left when Shaq was in Miami and Kobe requested a trade. Kobe wanted to be traded. But Jerry Buss said, I'm not trading you. And then Jerry Buss found a way to make it right with Kobe. He got pow. He got rid of Kwame Brown. 
got Pau Gasol and rebuilt that team essentially in an offseason. Essentially rebuilt that team from the ground up and got them a championship and got them three trips to the finals, two championships. That's the difference. Larry Bird came in to the NBA on a well-coached, well-run organization. Magic stepped into the league, and Kareem was already there. He stepped into the ring, into the NBA, and Kareem was arguably still the best player in the world. Not even arguably. I think he probably was the best player in the world at that time. And as we talk about Jordan, Jordan had Jerry Krause. Jordan had Jerry Krause, who is a fantastic general manager. Who was a fantastic general manager who built that team from the ground up around Jordan. And you got and when it comes to Jordan, Magic, and Bird, people back in those times, people didn't leave teams. You know why you see all this? Like movement around the NBA with all these superstars going from one team to one team, switching teams, requesting trades. It's because of LeBron. It's because LeBron was the first true superstar to go, first of all, and stop it. Time out, time out. Before we even get to that, first of all, Magic, Bird, and Jordan all got drafted to big markets. Yeah, Magic, Bird, Jordan, Kobe all got drafted to huge markets. That Boston tri-state area market, that is a big East Coast market. Magic got drafted to fucking Los Angeles. Jordan got drafted to Chicago. Chicago is a big market. Kobe, also LA. LeBron got drafted to Cleveland. Nobody wants to go to Cleveland? Who the fuck's trying to go to Cleveland? Cleveland? You couldn't get anybody to go to Cleveland. Chicago was Chicago. Chicago shy town. You could get people to come to LA like LeBron got Anthony Davis to come to Los Angeles to play with him and they won a championship. Like LeBron went down to Miami with like Dwayne Wade was able to get LeBron James and Chris Bosh to come to Miami to South Beach. Now, is Boston the hottest free agent destination? No, but Boston, very well coached, very well run organization at the time. And they built a team around Bird. Bird had very early success, very early on. And back then in Jordan's era, people just did people just didn't leave. That's just not how it was. And now you're in an era where people do leave. And that's thanks to LeBron. LeBron showed NBA superstars they really have. Don't. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. They weren't flip flops. LeBron's never been a flip flopper. LeBron has made it very clear he's about winning. And if you ain't on his level of trying to win, then he ain't fucking with you. LeBron's made it very clear through his actions over the last 10 plus years. He's about winning. And if you ain't trying to win like he's trying to win, then he's done with you. He left Cleveland, went to Miami, went to four straight finals, won two championships, went back to Cleveland because Kyrie Irving was already there and he felt like he owed Cleveland after the way he left. He felt like he owed Cleveland after the way the decision went down, and he didn't let anybody in the Cleveland office know that he was leaving. They found out when everybody else found out, and that was like the one, and that's one of the like two missteps in LeBron James's career, and that's it. And hardworking, hardworking Cobb responded to this. You know, M- and I quote, you know, MJ and Kobe were both about to leave their teams at one point, right? And it was because of their owners that they stay. Now, before Braun left the Cavs, 
the first time which one of those guys you named would have won a title with that team because they stayed because they got players. They got the players. Their owners did what it took to get the players it took to win. NBA trade machine. Jordan never won with any player winning an all-star team besides Pippen. No other player on his squad made the all-star team when they did, when they had Rodman, neither did when he was never, what? I mean, get your facts right. BJ Armstrong, Horace Grant, Dennis Rodman, all defensive first team. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, Shaq was an all-star right before he went to Cleveland. Was he an all-star in Cleveland? Once again, was the Judas Ngoskis an all-star with Cleveland? Antoine Walker was a shell of his former self. Don't even get me started on Mo Williams. You talk about people getting their facts right. You a clown, NBA trade machine. You a fucking clown. LeBron couldn't care. Yo. I love how people love he had to earn. LeBron didn't have to earn it. Yo, I mean, yo, this is, I don't understand why people hate LeBron so much. I've never gotten it. You want greatness? He's one of the five greatest players. He's without question one of the five greatest players ever. He's without question one of the three greatest players ever. He's without question the second greatest player ever. He's arguably the greatest of all time. What else do you want from him? Four MVPs, four championships, 10 finals appearances. He's one of the five greatest scorers ever. Yeah, I said that. He's one of the five greatest scorers ever. Now, people mistake actual scoring for scoring ability or offensive skill set. Does LeBron have the greatest offensive skill set of all time? No. Kevin Durant probably has the greatest offensive skill set of all time. You got to throw Michael Jordan in there, Kobe Bryant in there. You got to throw, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think, a guy, uh, Damon Lillard is probably up there too. Carmelo Anthony is one of those guys. Does LeBron James have the greatest offensive skill set of any player ever? No. But do you know what LeBron does have that most of those guys don't? LeBron James has averaged 25 points in all but one year. Of his playing career. All but one year. That's how great he is. So when people. So when people. Talk about LeBron James. So when people talk about. LeBron James. And this. This just this just nonsense. They, when people talk about this nonsense about LeBron James like cheating the NBA out of something, he didn't cheat the NBA out of shit. LeBron James knew he couldn't win in Cleveland with the way that team was constructed. He gave them seven years of his career. If LeBron James is drafted anywhere, if LeBron James is drafted to New York, Chicago, Miami, Detroit. When Detroit was great, if he had gotten drafted to San Antonio or Los Angeles or hell, Dallas, Boston, LeBron James gets drafted to like one of those places. LeBron James gets drafted to San Antonio and, and plays for Greg Popovich. 
for his entire career, he is without question the greatest player of all time. It's, it wouldn't even be close. It wouldn't even be close. Gilbert Arenas said something later earlier this year that LeBron James is going to go down as arguably the greatest player of all time, but the guy who never went who never maxed out his potential because he never had to. If LeBron James had been in Greg Popovich on Greg Popovich's team, he'd be the greatest player of all time. If he had been coached by a guy like Greg Popovich from jump, he'd be the greatest player of all time. And it wouldn't even wouldn't even be close. It wouldn't even be close. That's how much more talent he has than any other guy who has ever played this game. Now we're going to move over and get this, get these damn fools the hell out of my goddamn face. All right. NBA free bleacher reports, NBA free agents who could put contenders over the top. Nick Batum. Seriously? Nick Batum? That's what we doing? Nick? No. Yeah. He had a, he had a very good year. I'm, I'm not even going to cap. He had a very good year. But he didn't have a good enough year to, to, to be on this who can put a contender over the top. No. 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 Number two, Spencer Dinwiddie. There's five guys on this list. Spencer Dinwiddie. I love Spencer Dinwiddie. I love Sp- Spencer. He's only 28 years old. Uh, he just... I believe he's about to opt out of his $12.3 million deal. Of his last deal. He's a very good player. He's a phenomenal player. And if they had had him on the court in the Eastern Conference Finals, a healthy Spencer Dinwiddie, they beat the Milwaukee Bucks. You give me a 50, 60% James Harden. You give me Kevin Durant at 100%. You give me Spencer Dinwiddie at 100%. They beat the Bucks. They beat the Bucks. Best fits among the projected title contenders: Dallas Lakers, Clippers. I would love to see him with the Lakers. Ooh, I would love to see him with the Lakers. Oh God, not the Clippers. I think he'd be a good fit in Dallas with Luca. I think, yeah, I think he'd be a good fit with Luca. He averaged where was it? 20 and 7 during the uh 2019 2020 season you know Kevin Durant was hurt uh Kyrie Irving was in and out of the lineup and James Harden wasn't on the team yet but that's still great numbers number 3 Reggie Bullock 3 and D ring I give you that one I like I like him I like him he was like jacking like eight threes a game after March 1st but I like him. Likely, per likely contenders: Atlanta, Denver, and the Lakers. Cal Lowry, no brainer. Anywhere he goes, if he's in L.A. and you get a healthy LeBron James and a borderline healthy Anthony Davis, they're the favorites next year if they can get Cal Lowry. I just don't think they have the the. I don't think they had. He has the 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 capital to get him. Away from, away from uh, Toronto, Miami. I think that's a good fit for his. Definitely for his personality. Uh, I like his game. Uh, I'm assuming they probably have to get rid of uh, what's his name, the Dragon Goran Dragic. Assuming they'd have to get rid of Goran Dragic. I don't know about the fit in Dallas because Luke is such a ball dominant guard right now. I don't know if Dallas would be a great fit for him. Uh, Doug McDermott. I like this one. I like Doug McDermott. Let's see. Uh, projected best fit among projected contenders, the Lakers, the Miami Heat, and the Philadelphia 76ers. I think you'd be great in Philly. You can never have enough shooting in Philly, especially if for some inexplicable reason you feel like keeping Ben Simmons. Uh, in Miami, I think he he and Duncan Robinson play a very similar role, so I don't think he's a great fit there. The Lakers, if the Lakers are going to get – are going to trade – um. Kyle Kuzma, yeah, I think he could take over Kyle Kuzma's spot. I think he's a much more consistent shooter than 
Kuzma, he's definitely a better three-point shooter. I think he's a more consistent three-point shooter. And I feel like he's at the age. I think he's at the age where he knows his role. He's not trying to make a name for himself. He's not exact. He's not exactly a good defender, which could be a problem because the Lakers are a team that wins on defense. They're a defensive team with two phenomenal offensive players. They still had one of the best defenses in the league last year, despite all the injuries. Frank Vogel is a phenomenal defensive coach. So I think he still hits almost 40% of his threes. So I think that would offset his lack of defense. But yeah, I like Doug McDermott. I like Doug McDermott. I think he would be very good on the Lakers. I don't like the Miami Heat because him and Duncan Robinson, I feel like, play the same position. I like him in Philly, especially if for some inexplicable, once again, it's for some inexplicable reason, you're going to keep Ben Simmons, which still makes no sense, but he needs to get the fuck out of there. But yeah, those, I like those. I like Doug McDermott. I think Doug McDermott's best fit would be the Lakers. I think Kyle Lowry's best fit is probably in Miami. I think he'd I think he'd be great in LA too, but I think his best fit would probably be in Miami. As for Reggie Bullock, let's see, they got Atlanta, Denver, and the Lakers. Hmm. I think his minutes would probably cut into Michael Porter Jr.'s minutes, or you could put Porter at the four and him at the three. Huh. Huh. Well, Atlanta, ah, actually, I think the most playing time he would get would probably be in Atlanta. Playing, because you got a lot of threes in Atlanta. You you got a lot of a lot of threes across the Eastern Conference with Kevin Durant. Now, Bullock's not stopping Kevin Durant, but maybe he can met, make Kevin Durant's life slightly more difficult. Same thing with Giannis Antetokounmpo, maybe make his life slightly more difficult. But I think Atlanta would probably be Bullock's best place to play. As for uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, yeah, I don't know because I don't think either all any of these. I don't think he's. I don't think he's great in Brooklyn because they already they already have three ball handlers in Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving. So Dallas maybe. To play next to Luca, maybe they could do like a little two man thing in the backcourt. You got the Lakers. I think he, I think he fit well with the Lakers. LeBron's been playing a little more off ball last couple years. Uh, I think he'd be really good for the Clippers because they need an offensive guard. They need an often a big offensive guard because Reggie Jackson. I think he's a little too hit and miss. I think he's a little too streaky. I think. Spencer Dinwiddie could be a more consistent guy in the on the Clippers starting lineup. But you'd have you'd probably have to get rid of Jackson and keep uh Patrick Beverly on the bench to play against like, you know, smaller guards. You could put Dinwiddie at the one and Patrick and uh No, because you probably put you could put you could put Paul George at the three or the four. Same thing with Kawhi. You still, they still need a center. I feel like they need more of a center. And I feel like they need more of a big man in uh, in LA right now. And as for Nicholas Batum, let him stay in the Clippers. Do not put him in Utah, because in Utah he instantly moves up to like the fourth guy. He instantly moves up to like the third guy on that team, third or fourth guy on that team. No, uh, I would say stay with the Clippers if I'm Nick, Nick, Nicholas Batum. You were so trash in Charlotte your last year, I and you had a resurgence in L.A. I'd say stick with the Clippers, take a pay cut. All right, that is it for this particular segment. When we get back, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to go off on UFC 264, Poirier McGregor 3. All right, boys and girls, we back. Uh, this is like the longest episode I've done in a very long time. It's been a while since so much shit has happened that I really wanted to talk about. But we are about to hit UFC 264 Poirier 
McGregor 3. We stick to the main card only. We stick to the main card only. I do not watch all six hours, as I said earlier. But first things first, we're going to hit the uh, opening fight on the main card. Sugar Sean O'Malley versus Chris Mojito. Mojito, something like that. Got to learn how to pronounce this kid's name correctly because, man, this kid's got a fan out of me. This is one tough motherfucker. He got destroyed in this fight. Three rounds, to be honest. Herb Dean did stop the fight in the third round, which a lot of people now weren't comfortable with. A lot of people weren't enthusiastically happy about because a lot of people thought, man, he had been getting his ass whooped so bad that, honestly, might as well just let him finish the fight. The kid was still standing. Yeah, he was bloodied as fuck, but he was still standing. He looked coherent. He was still throwing bombs. He just wasn't connecting on any of them. He This was not... He took this fight on short notice. Big ups to the kid for taking this fight on short notice, but he was not ready for, for Sean O'Malley. He just wasn't ready for Sugar Sean O'Malley. He, he, he wasn't. And it's got nothing to do with him, but he himself just wasn't ready. The the division you can talk about, like he himself, he just wasn't ready for this particular. Say about the yeah, we're gonna do it by division. This is the bantamweight division. Yeah, he just wasn't ready for that a central division, man. He just wasn't. I mean, O'Malley is like ranked. I forget where he's ranked on the. I forget where he's ranked in the. I forget. I'm trying to remember. I forget where he's ranked among the bantamweights, but I know he's somewhere in the top ten. I'm pretty, yeah, pretty sure he's somewhere in the top ten. And I think his original opponent, who I'm not sure who his original opponent was supposed to be, but his original opponent, uh, I think, got injured. And he got hurt, and the new kid, and the new kid got hurt. And I'm trying to run. Where's the, the bantamweight division? Yeah, O'Malley's a bantamweight, right? Yeah, it was O'Malley's a bantamweight. So I thought he was ranked somewhere in the top ten. Uh, apparently, he's not. Because I'm looking at the top 15 for the Bantamweight division, and O'Malley's not ranked on there. At least I don't see him ranked, yeah, unless he's, like, in a completely different division. Yeah, he's not ranked, so, uh, but he's a big, but he's kind of a big name right now in the Bantamweight division. But third round, TKO, but it was a huge disparity. Sean O'Malley hit. 230 of his 318 total strikes, 230 significant strikes to Chris's 70 out of 218 and 70 out of two. I mean, O'Malley had a knockdown. I mean, strikes by position, distance, clinch. I mean, O'Malley kind of picked this kid apart. And big ups to the kid. They might nickname uh, the zombie. I know you got the Korean zombie, but this kid deserves like the zombie nickname. No matter how much O'Malley hit him, kid would not go down. And I think I felt it. And I don't know if O'Malley felt it, but I felt it for O'Malley when Herb Dean stopped the fight. O'Malley had to breathe in the side of relief for like, fuck, God damn, thank God. I'm done with this dude because this dude would not die. If I'm in my corner after the second, I'm going, no matter, this motherfucker won't go down. He won't die. 
this bitch won't die. <laughs> you ever watch Dragon Ball Z? No, never say die. That classic Vegeta line when he like rips apart. What was it? Nineteen. It was Android nineteen, I believe it was. It was nineteen or twenty. I forgot. Fuck, what the name the Android name was. <laughs> Ripped off the Android's arm. Says never say die. This kid refused to go down, and I got and he's got a fan in me. I can't wait to see him on his next card. I know he's he gonna be in the hospital for a while. He gotta get his face checked out. My man had a crimson mask. He had a crimson mask the whole, basically the whole round, basically the whole fight since the end of the first quarter, end of the first round. He this dude had a crimson mask, and it. It looked like he didn't belong in there with O'Malley. O'Malley, I feel like he's on the cusp of jumping into like the bantamweight rankings. He's on he's on that cusp of jumping into the bantamweight rankings, and probably with his next fight, he'll be one of those guys in the bantamweight rankings. One of those guys who are in the top fifteen, climbing his way to a title shot, a title shot he legitimately deserves. So I can't wait to see that happen for him. Absolutely can't wait to see that happen for him. And I want to see, and I want to see, I like O'Malley. I've been a fan of O'Malley since the first time I saw him on uh, Dana White's Contender Series when, you know, he like knock out and walk away shit. I love it. Absolutely love it. So I would like to, I would very much like to see him, you know, keep going up the rankings, maybe eventually challenge for the Bantamweight. Uh, Bantamweight title, but he's got a lot of guys to go up through. He's got a lot of guys to go up through. You got Kyler Phillips, who I'm assuming is almost essentially like right ahead of him. You still got Dominic Cruz, Frankie Ed- Edgar, Cody Garbrandt, who's a former champion, Jose Aldo, who's a former champion. Uh, 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 uh Pedro was at Munoz. I mean, Jimmy Rivera, Marlo Vera. Marlon Vera, Marlon, Marlon, whatever, doesn't matter. But yeah, he's got some guys ahead of him. Uh, next fight of the card, Irina Aldana and Yana. Well, Irina and Yana, they were the female fight on the main, the women's, uh, I forgot which. This would have been the, what is it? Uh, featherweight fight, I think it was. No, it was a bantamweight fight. First round, knockout. Arena knocked this woman out. In the first round, destroyed her. I wouldn't say destroyed her, but she she has some Irina has some serious power. A couple of hits, and this Yana girl was bleeding. There are the four and fifth rank fighters in the bantamweight division, and that division, I believe, is home to one. If memory serves, that division is home to the pound for pound queen. The lioness Amanda Nunez. Yeah. This this is home to the pound for pound queen. So yeah. Amanda Nunez. Just folding bitches. Just folding bitches. And Arena is I think she's fourth. And she's fourth now. Uh, they might update the rankings, but right now she is fourth. You got three other ladies ahead of her. She may be close to getting herself a title shot. And I, I didn't really, I don't really know much about either one of these fighters. So excuse me, I didn't really. I watched this, was like, okay, I'm still, I'm still learning, I'm still getting back into it, learning a lot of the fighters. There's a hell of a lot more fighters now than when I first started watching, and a hell of a lot more than when I stopped watching. Next fight, Tia, let's go, Bam Bam against Greg Hardy. If you're a fight fan, you know who Bam Bam man. Bam Bam dude out here drinking beers out of people's shoes against uh, Prince of War Greg Hardy in the heavyweight division. Neither of these guys are ranked, but this was a quick fight. A quick, quick fight. A quick knockout. Goddamn, both of these guys are fucking done. Because, uh, what was that? Tia, it looks like he's uh New Zealander, Maui. But hit him. 11 total strikes from um, uh, Bam Bam and six strikes from Hardy. And fight was over. Uh, Hardy falls to like seven and four, I think. 
and I don't remember uh, Bam Bam's uh, record off the top of my head right now. But no strikes. Hardy went in there and got clipped and got put to sleep. That was the fight. He went in, got clipped. He was aggressive. Went in, got clipped, went to sleep. Went to sleep. And it's over. It was, it was, it was over him. And you got Gilbert Burns and uh, Stephen Th- and Stephen Thompson, uh, Wonder Boy, who I'd known some of because I'd seen his fight. His see- I'd seen a couple of his fight with Tyron Woodley, but thirty eight. I mean, he lost by uh, Wonder Boy lost by unanimous decision. Uh, Wonder uh, Gilbert Burns is now he's a second rank fighter in his division, and I believe this is the welterweight division for the men. Yep, right behind Colby Covington, and now you got. Kamara Uzma is still the welterweight king, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There is nothing Gilbert Burns showed me last night, not last night, like two nights ago, that shows me that he might be able to take that belt from Uzman. But he, 100, he had he landed 80% of his total strikes. Wonderboy only 60%. Kept this fight essentially on the ground. The whole fight. Essentially kept this fight on the ground and won by an eked out. Nah, I won't say eked out. He was pretty dominant, but he won by unanimous decision. Wasn't able to finish Wonderboy. And Wonderboy really wasn't able to get his, you know, striking down and where he really wasn't able to get his range in. Really wasn't able to, you know, you know, kind of pick this dude apart and just beat him. Just beat him. Beat him up for three rounds. And your main event of the evening. The notorious Conor McGregor versus Diamond Dustin Poirier. Uh, Poirier wins by Dr. Stoppage because Conor broke his ankle. Which really doesn't matter because Conor was getting his ass whooped anyway. I know the total strikes may toll. Yeah, yeah, but Conor was getting his ass whooped anyway. Poirier had McGregor on the ground and he was pummeling him. And he was pummeling him. So after that first round, I think Poirier would have made it a point to take down McGregor in the second round, and I think he would have finished him in the second round. But Poirier's wrestling was better than McGregor's, and Poirier, he's looking for a title shot right now. He's probably going to, I don't know if he's going to get a title shot. He might be next in line to get a title shot against Charles Oliveira. That's a fight I think a lot of people will want to see. But it might be, and this fight, because of the way the fight ended, I assume we're going to see a fourth a fourth fight between these two. Because although Poirier was winning, McGregor lost because he broke his ankle, man. And it wasn't because, like, Poirier broke his ankle on, like, a submission. Or he, like, yeah, he, he broke his ankle because, man, he just stepped on it and the shit snapped. And it just snapped. It was so wild. It was, it's like, man, I've been back. I've been watching UFC on a regular back for like the for like four or five months, and we got two bad leg injuries between the injury to uh, Chris Weidman and now the injury to McGregor. I know McGregor's gonna want a rematch, and he might get one. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do a fourth one because of how this one ended. But the fourth one, I think it's time for Connor to maybe retire because I think he's just past his prime. I think he's past his prime. I don't think I don't think he can hang with the top of the lightweight division anymore. I just don't think so. I know he's ranked fifth right now, but I don't think he can hang with the top of the lightweight division anymore. So if I was him, I'd, I'd take this as a sign to keep it moving. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think he's going to be back for another fight with Poirier, and I think he's going to get destroyed in that fight. I honestly believe that. I think he's going to get destroyed in that fight. But ladies and gentlemen, that is it. For this episode of the Technical File Podcast, I'm your host, Jay, and uh, we're out for the day. Remember to like, share, subscribe, give us five stars. If you give us four stars, I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. What you know about rolling down in the deep when your brain goes numb? You can call that mental freeze when these people talk too much. Put that shit in slow motion. Yeah, I feel like an astronaut in the ocean.